The Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. 4.6 thousand million years old. The first replicating systems emerged about 4 billion years ago. Following those first replicators came the first bacterial-like cells. And if you go to Western Australia, you can see in Shark Bay stromatolites that contain these first bacteria 3.5 billion years old. After this came the eukaryotic cells, very simple to begin with. These eukaryotic cells arose as a consequence of the engulfment of a bacterial-like cell by the ancestral eukaryote cell. And evidence of that exists today in our own cells. The mitochondria that are the powerhouses of our cells were once free-living bacteria. That was around two billion years ago that the first eukaryotic cells arose. An additional engulfment event by a eukaryote-like cell also took place. On that occasion, shortly after the evolution of the eukaryotes, a cyanobacteria, a photosynthetic bacterium, was engulfed by this ancestral eukaryotic cell, and that gave rise to the algae, which eventually gave rise to the plants. Sex evolved about 1.2 billion years ago, again in the eukaryotic line. And about 1 billion years ago, multicellular life began to emerge. And it emerged repeatedly, in fact, on at least a dozen different occasions in all of the different lineages of life. About 560 million years ago, we had a, a, a seminal event uh, in life's diversification fueled by the evolution of multicellularity. It's known as the Cambrian explosion. It was responsible uh, for the emergence of all of the complex life forms that we see on Earth today. Moving forward in time then, about 300 million years ago, the first amphibians, 200 million years ago, uh, the first mammals, birds, about 100 million years ago. The emergence of the genus Homo from our ancestor Australopithecines took place a mere 2 million years ago, with the first modern humans, Homo sapiens, emerging around 400,000 to 250,000 years ago a mere drop, of course, in the ocean of evolutionary time. In painting this brief picture of life's evolution and concluding with Homo sapiens, I perhaps give the impression that we are the pinnacle of evolution and of biological complexity, that we are somehow the natural destination of the evolutionary process, that evolution was designed to deliver us. But that is quite wrong, but it is a common misconception. If we were to be able to replay the evolution of life's tape, it's highly unlikely that something like Homo sapiens would exist today. If we take a step back from the four billion years of life's evolution and look at where life started and where it is now, then it is difficult to escape the conclusion that over this time period there has been an inexorable rise in biological complexity. Take the first replicating systems. Although no one can be exactly sure how they looked, they were probably little more than a set of chemical reactions, possibly not even enclosed within a membrane. Now, some might argue that we Homo sapiens are nothing more than a set of limited chemical reactions, but even if you wish to take this view, the chemical reactions that take place within a multicellular organism do so across space and time in millions of separate cellular compartments whose separate activities are regulated and carefully coordinated. There really is little doubt that at the basic level that I've just alluded to, and in fact at others, there has been a gradual increase in life's complexity across evolutionary time. Now my goal this afternoon is to paint a picture of the evolution of complexity. I intend to do this with reference to the underlying principles, uh, rather than via a conventional tour and description in a taxonomic sense of life's diversity. The journey, of course, begins with Charles Darwin uh, and will, I am afraid, bring you face to face with some of the most challenging and complex problems in biology. Charles Darwin was a rather ordinary sort of man in an upper class Victorian manner, but he had a remarkable idea that life in all of its diversity, its beauty, its grandeur 
can be explained by a simple algorithmic process. Darwin referred to this process as natural selection. This is an extraordinary idea, a remarkable idea, and without doubt the most important idea the world has ever been presented with. Without this idea, the journey that we're about to take this afternoon would not in fact be possible. Now Darwin's idea, as we encountered it today, is formulated as scientific theory. And I want to stress that scientific theory is more than just a good idea. Darwin's idea is supported by a vast wealth of data, painstakingly acquired by literally thousands of scientists, including, of course, Darwin, over the last 150 or so years. As a result, the theory of natural selection has moved well beyond sound idea to established scientific fact. A fact as certain as the Earth is round and as established as the theory of gravity. But like any area of science, the theory of natural selection is not without controversy. However, the controversy is not over whether it works. That it works is established fact. The controversy is over how it works and why it works. And here there is healthy, vibrant, and vigorous debate um, amongst a, a range of scientists and philosophers. What then is natural selection? Natural selection is a cold, blind, hard, mechanical process. It's brutal. It's an algorithm, a set of mindless instructions that can be counted on logically to deliver a certain kind of result. Long division, for example, is an algorithmic process. Our computer programs are nothing but algorithmic processes. Natural selection requires no guiding hand, uh, no intelligent designer. And of course, this is why Darwin's idea is so extraordinary, so radical, uh, to some so threatening and dangerous. Natural selection is survival of the fittest. And to borrow from Richard Dawkins, evolution by natural selection is the non-random survival of randomly generated variation. Now, I particularly like Richard's definition because it highlights an important misconception. Many people think that evolution by natural selection is a random process and, of course, understandably, cannot understand how a random process can generate life's diversity. But as I said, and as Richard's definition states, evolution is not a random process. Again, to borrow from Richard, evolution by natural selection is the non-random survival of randomly generated variants. The variation upon which natural selection acts is randomly generated, but natural selection acts systematically to bias the survival of variants such that those most suited to prevailing conditions survive to leave offspring. The theory of natural selection has extraordinary explanatory power. It provides a framework within which we can here fathom uh, the evolution of biological complexity. It can explain, account for, for the evolution of life's diversity, the origin of adaptations. It explains the striking fit between organism and environment such as we see, for example, in the orchid that mimics a bee. It explains disease, sex, death, aging, societies, religions, and even, some argue, the existence of this and other universes. Given all that it claims and is proven to do in many instances, it may surprise you that there are just three requirements for this algorithmic process natural selection to work. Any population of entities, be they animate or inanimate, that has variation, firstly, reproduction, secondly, and thirdly, heredity, such that when those entities reproduce, the offspring resemble the parents, will evolve by natural selection. There simply is no choice about it. So any population, such as we have here, when individuals differ one to another, as we have here, uh, where individuals can reproduce, as is the case here, and where reproduction results in offspring that resemble the parents, there will be evolution by natural selection. An entity that has these three properties, variation, reproduction, and heredity, is known as a Darwinian individual. 
A Darwinian individual can participate in the process of evolution by natural selection. Individuality in a Darwinian sense is central to all that follows. And I will have done my job well if by the end of this lecture you understand that individuality in this Darwinian sense operates at different levels of biological organization.